Well, let's just, let's just pray this morning before we get into this session. Lord Jesus, I just, I praise you, Lord, and I thank you for your goodness to us. And I thank you for meeting us here, and I thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. And I pray that today he would walk amongst us and he would minister to hearts and he would speak to each and every one of us in this room. And Lord, I just, um, I thank you for your love for us. I thank you that, Lord, you're just simply there waiting for us to meet with you. It's not you who have ever moved, it's always us. And so, Lord, I pray that you just draw our hearts into a sweet fellowship with you and, and a deeper devotional life and a deeper longing, Lord, to be filled with your spirit and to, to serve and to, Lord, just pour out that agape love in us for our congregations and our, our families, Lord, and our husbands and our children, Lord, that you would just make us stronger women in you and godly women in you and righteous and holy before you. May you help us make the right choices, Lord. May you give us wisdom with other people and with raising children. Thank you, Lord, that you have all these resources and we simply have to ask. Thank you that you are that kind of a God that hears and sees. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our devotional life. I think it, if, if you would ask me, what is the passion of your life? And I, I would have to say it is that all women would have a better devotional life. And I think it is a big struggle. And especially if you have a full-time job outside the home or even outside your church. And, and it's very hard to get up early. Or if you have a new baby and, you know, those moms, they just, it's, they're, they're exhausted. And my daughter-in-law had a new baby a couple years ago, again, number uh, two-year-old Taylor. And, you know, she's just running ragged and she's an RN. And so those are like 12-hour shifts. And so all of the things that go on, you come home to the children, which is 24-7, you know, they get, they have nightmares or they're sick in the night and all you go through. And I just look at her and, and, you know, at one point she just had a sinus infection she couldn't get rid of and she had dark circles under her eyes and I just felt so bad for her. And, um, and she had to learn to start getting up earlier and plan that day with her devotions. And I watched her just go more, grow more peaceful and, you know, we were sitting actually in Bible study together one day, and the, the speaker said, if you want to be a good mom, you've got to have a devotional life. So just think about that. And it was cute. We smiled. But that's what we're going to talk a little bit about this morning. And, and you probably all have great devotional lives, and I'm probably speaking to the wall. But I know I need to be reminded. And I want to remind you to tell your children today. I think that's one thing. You all have children and grandchildren you have nieces and nephews, you have an influence on another generation. So it is so important. One day I was staying um, in San Jose with my kids because that, uh, by the way, I ha we have 12 grandchildren and two great grandchildren. And one of our children gave us seven, so that's where they all came from. The other two has only two so far and the other one has three, they're all grown up, two of them are married. So number seven here, and she's done. Now this time she really says she's done, because I told people she was done at six. But then she turned 40 and wanted just one more. And so they have Ruthie. And, um, and so when she would have a baby, I would say, I will come help you. I think I only missed one child. And I said, and I'll, I'll just come help you with all the other kids, and you just take care of the baby. And so I'll come up for like a week every time you, I didn't know she was going to have so many. But... <laughs> But it's been great fun. It really has. She's a school teacher. She's used to a whole classroom. So, and, and my son loves kids, so they actually are thrilled. And she told me the other day, she said, I'd have helped a bunch more if I could have. And I thought, wow. And she had C-sections. So it's just amazing to me. I look at her. My other sons look at her and daughter-in-laws and go, my daughter-in-law that has two, she had number one. And I remember her sitting on the sofa at my house exhausted and saying, I really don't know how Brenda does this. <laughs> so, but you know what? Everybody has a different calling. And Brenda says, hey, the Muslims are having lots of children. Why shouldn't the Christians? So she, you know, I, I just didn't do good with the birth thing. It was really painful. <laughs> so after three, and then after I had my three, I realized I could only handle those three. 
But I remember one day when I was visiting him, and maybe it was number two or three, whatever, child born, and I was, everyone gets up, Mike and Brenda get up, have their quiet time. I'm on the sofa in the living room having a quiet time, and the oldest, Daniel, comes through, who is heading into his, what is he going to be, 18th birthday, 18th or 19th. And he's the oldest, and he said, uh, he's looking at us all. I think he's about three years old, three or four. And pretty soon I go out to fix breakfast for everybody. And he's parked himself at the kitchen table with a little New Testament that I think I had in college that now he has. And he's got out a pencil, and he's going to work on his New Testament. And I walked by him by the back of him. I said, Daniel, I don't think I'd ride in that Bible if I were you. I think I'd wait till I'm a little older. And he goes, why not, Mimi? You guys all do it. And I go, have at it. Have at it, Daniel. <laughs> I'm going to be the good grandma. Let the mom deal with them. And I thought, don't discourage the kid. You know, whatever is working for him. And so I, I just think, what a great example. I remember my mom. My parents were Christians when I was born. And I remember my mom sitting with a huge Bible. And she was teaching an elderly lady Sunday school class. And I remember her studying her lessons and her quiet time. And I remember a notebook that she had. I think I still have it somewhere. It was just one of those spiral notebooks, lined paper. And she would get up in the morning not to disturb my dad and go into the bathroom and turn the light on and probably sit on the floor in there. And this had pasted pictures of the missionaries from their church in it and prayers and requests. And when I read that in later years, the verses she had claimed for us kids, and every day at 5 a.m. And then when I married my husband, I found that his mother did the exact same thing. She was up every day at 5. And I, I used to say, you know, if God was ever good to Don and I at all, it's not because of us. It's because of our mothers <laughs> and their love for the Lord. And it was just an example to us. It was a great example to us. When I was in high school, some of you, you know me pretty well, and my parents decided that, you know, we needed to go to a Christian school. And so they sent me to Christian school, and they picked one in Florida. And I lived in Pasadena. And so my brother had gone before me, and he loved it, so they sent me. And I got on a train with a few other kids that were going to the school, and we went all the way to Chicago, because I don't know why the train tracks go through Texas. I just don't understand that. But you have to go up to Chicago from California and down to Florida. Does anybody know why that is? I go, really? We have freeways everywhere. Why couldn't they have figured out the train tracks? I don't know. Chicago was big, and probably in those days, Florida didn't have air conditioning systems, so people didn't go there as much. I don't know. But anyway, we had to go. So it was a long trip, about three days, going through the country. And I remember being in boarding school. It was a Christian school. And I remember sitting at the dining room table one night, because we all had meals together in, in the dining room, and they tried to teach us manners and things like that. And, my mother said to me one day, she said, I don't know if I was misbehaving or what I was doing, but she said, Jean, I thought I raised you to be a lady. I said, well, you married me off to Don, and I had three boys. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm sitting at the table, and um, I really can't figure out why people get saved and why some grow and some don't. And some people you meet, you meet them a few years later, and they've gone way beyond you. I mean, they are just like, so spiritual. And then there's someone else here that you meet them again, and they're living right back in the world where they were before, and they don't even look like they're saved, and what happened to them? And of course, as I grew and I, I read the scriptures, I realized Jesus explained that pretty clearly with the seed that was on the ground and took root, and the cares of the world, and enemy coming in and snatching it away. And I thought that was just such a great illustration to see that. But at that time, I thought, why does this happen to people? How can you really, really love Jesus and then not love him? And so this guy was sitting next to me. I think he was a year or two older. And, and um, I said, can you answer a question for me? And I asked him this question. And at that young age, the Lord just gave me a great answer through him. And he said, it's really simple, Gene. It depends on if they have a devotional life. And the ones that have one grow. And the ones that don't, don't grow. And I found that so true. When we went back to Calvary Costa Mesa to help Chuck in his last couple years, and I taught Kay's Bible study, I remember I was blown away with the maturity of the women in that group. 
And I instinctively knew it was because Kay had taken him through the Word of God and so had Chuck. And I think as you take your women through God's Word, there is a real maturity that comes in your congregation that if you just do other things or you skirt that issue and, and you have great events but you don't have any real in-depth going through the Word of God studies, there's not that maturity. And so I really, really encourage you in that. It's so important. The scripture says, keep your, your heart with all diligence in Proverbs 4. Turn over to Luke chapter 10. You know the story by heart. Mary and Martha, but just remind us of those couple verses. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Love Mary and Martha. <laughs> First Chronicles 28, 9 says, If you seek him, he will be found of thee. And that's what Mary did. You know, I, I go to bed at night, and if you've got any problems in your life, and of course as pastors' wives, you don't have any problems in your life, let alone the congregation or your children. But we do. We go through trials and tribulations. I think the hardest one for me as a pastor's wife, just being totally honest with you, is when people would leave the church. Does, it, does that hurt? That to me is the most, that was the most painful thing. And it was making people happy and, you know, all of those things. I worry about people. I want them all to be happy and joyful. And so sometimes we go through real painful things and sometimes people turn on us. And there's all kinds of reasons and usually it's the enemy because the enemy doesn't like your church. And he doesn't like your Christian walk and he doesn't want you to be deep with the Lord. And so these things are not always easy. But I found that those things that concerned me when I'd wake in the night or wake in the early morning hours when it's dark and you can't go back to sleep because you're thinking about this trial, that when I picked up my Bible and started reading in the morning and got my cup of coffee, it was a but God moment in the word of God. And he would answer all of those things that were so disturbing to me in the darkness of the night. And I found that he had answers, exact answers for the things unbelievable sometimes, so clear, answers for those situations and to those problems and promises that he would give me. And you know when, well let's just read this with Mary and Martha real quick. And now it happened in verse 38 that they went, they entered a certain village, Jesus' disciples, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house, and we know that they became very good friends, Jesus, Mary, and Martha. And she had a sitting Lazarus. Jesus had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. And Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. She's going to go tattle on her sister. Isn't that what a sister does a lot of times? Look, get her off her haunches and tell her to get in the kitchen. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you're worried and you're troubled about many things, but one thing is really needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. I love it. It won't be taken away from her. Service is way up there on a list of importance in your Christian walk, but Jesus said there's one thing above that, and that is devotion. That sitting at his feet, and without it, we don't serve well because we're running on our own steam, and we aren't listening. And I often find that those people burn out. Do you know people in your church, or maybe you yourself, that you're constantly just stressed about Christian service and what you're doing, and you want to do everything right, and, you're, you, know, and you put a burden on yourself way over the top, and, and, do, and you can burn out. But if you stop and regroup, like Elijah, and you go into the cave <laughs> with your light and your Bible, you get refreshed. It's like when you're on a diet, and you're, so I've been doing this diet for the last couple weeks, and no sugar. And honestly, the other night, I was at the end of my rope. I was in Philadelphia, and I was with Joe Foch's wife, and we're out looking for princess dresses for our grandchildren. And it was a super deal at the store, and I'm dragging, and she said, do I need to take you home for a nap? I said, I am just, I need a cup of coffee or something. And on this diet, you can't have any sugar. And so she said, it's the diet. So I went home that night, <clears throat> went back, and Don was preaching somewhere, and so I was in my room, and I just thought, I've got yogurt in the fridge, 
and there's honey in the cupboard. <laughs> I thought, I'm having yogurt and honey, I don't care what this diet says. And I picked a yogurt that was acceptable later on in the diet, and, and I just threw some honey on there. Not too much. You're not supposed to have any sugar honey for the first few weeks. You're, you're detoxing. And I ate that honey and that yogurt, and I text Kathy, and I said, I'm feeling great. And I think, I think it's scriptural because honey's in the Bible. And she, she texts me back, and she said, yeah, but John, John the Baptist ate, he ate locusts with it, and locusts is protein, so you could have that. I got, no, thank you. <laughs> but where was I? <laughs> Mary, Mary fell in love with Jesus. Her soul fell in love with him. And we know that because she, she put the perfume on him. And when she listened at his feet, she realized who he was. And she realized what he was doing for her. And I'm not so sure she didn't even get the crucifixion over his disciples because she anointed him. Whether she knew what she was doing at that time, I don't know. But we know that she had complete devotion to him. I remember when I, I first met Don, I couldn't wait to be with him. And we went to two different colleges. He went to my church. He was in the college department. It was great. I, I went home from summer. I was going to summer school and, and different stuff. And I finally came home at the end of the summer, and he was in my church. And I just thought, he's kind of cute. I like him. And I looked at the whole youth group, and I go, no, he's the one. He looks like he loves the Lord, and he looks like a lot of fun. I didn't know how much fun he was going to be. And, um, and so I picked him. I looked at that group, and my mom said, well, just pray about it. I go to, I go to a prayer meeting with his mother. I go, this is working out well. <laughs> and so anyway, I just, and so I just prayed. I gave it to the Lord, and at the, the end of that summer, he saw me at church, and he was sitting, there was one person between us, and he leaned over, and he started talking to me, and he asked me out. And, you know, I couldn't wait to see him. I just couldn't wait. But we went to two different colleges that fall. I was going to Santa Barbara to school, and he went to Pomona, Cal Poly, and I was going to Westmont. And so we were a few hours apart. And you know what? I loved it because he couldn't wait to see me either. And, and I remember he would call me sometimes, and i go, oh, how are you? Everything's going, thinking he's calling from Cal Poly. And I said, where are you? And he says, I'm downstairs in your dorm. And so boys weren't allowed upstairs in those days. It was nice. And um, I was so excited that he would make that effort, and I could not wait to see him. And I fell madly in love with him. And I think that is how it is with Jesus. I, girls come to me and they say, how do you know, young girls, when you're in love? That's a great question. I used to want to know that. I remember having a big discussion with my girlfriend one summer in college. How in the world are we going to know if we're ever in love? How do you know that? It's probably because I had not been in love. And when I met Dawn, the answer came. I knew I was in love because I didn't want to ever go out with anyone else again. I had lost my taste for looking at anyone else. And that's how it is with Jesus. You know you fall in love with him when the world loses its attraction to you. And all you can't wait to go to bed at night and think about that cup of coffee or whatever you drink in the morning, it wakes me up, and sitting down with Jesus and seeing what he has to say to us. It made her discerning, and it, it will give us answers to our problems. God gives us those answers in the morning, and it is so encouraging to us. Those things from the word. I remember one time I was on a, uh, in England and um, at Nancy Sylvester's church, and Dave, and we were speaking there, and they are just great fun. And she came to me. She's a great prayer warrior. And I said, Nancy, what can I pray for you? And she was really praying against the animal, your uh, animal, <laughs> enemy who is an animal. And um, it's a demonic city. York is a lot of witchcraft. And so she said, can you pray about that with our church against the enemy and those kind of things? But she didn't ask me how she could pray for me, which I didn't even think about. You know, I was on the mission trip there. But the next day she came to me and she said, I asked the Lord how to pray for you, which was far better when you asked the Lord. And he told me to pray for this situation in your life. It was one of my kids going through a hard time. And she said, the Lord knows all about it. It was a test. And the Lord was taking him through this test, and he was going to fix him, and he was going to take care of this whole thing. 
and um, this problem time was going to end, and it was going to be the last test for him. The Lord was, you know, trim the hedge. Now he's pulling it by the root, and he's going to deal with them. The rascally one. And so I said, Lord, can you confirm that to me and your word? Because I prayed about this for a long time. And that day in my devotions, the next morning, Habakkuk 2, 3. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end, and it will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come, and it will not delay. And I knew that I knew. And in three months, God ripped into that kid and totally turned his life upside down. And today, he's walking with the Lord. He just, his, his whole life is different. And he serves the Lord. And he, you know, he gives the Lord his business and his company. And he's married to a godly woman who loves Jesus and has her devotions every day. And, you know, I just... I'm so grateful that the Lord gave me that answer because I was so stressed out about it. And it just gave me, okay. He saw it. He knows, and he's going to answer. And that's what your devotions do for you. They take away all the stress. You don't need to shrink. Well, some of you might. I don't know. But <laughs> only go to a godly one. <laughs> But Jesus is the best of all because he knows everything. And you know, the best part is he knows the future, so he knows what's coming, so he's going to help you through that. And he won't leave you or forsake you, but God has the answer. Psalm 46, 4 says, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Water is really important. If you take a, a trip to Israel, they will tell you, the guides all the time, oh, water is so important. I understand it. I live in California. Water is so important. I'm so excited. We had so much water this year. We're like over our normal, and it's so exciting because I can, you know, take baths and water the lawn this summer and flush toilets. It's great. I'm not kidding you. It was pretty bad out there. And so when you realize you don't have water, there's so many things that stop. <laughs> You know, like my lawn died and all those kind of things. So water, you can't live without it. You can live a long time without food, but you can't live a long time without water. And you ever know when you don't feel good, you go, oh, I just feel kind of yucky. And you realize you haven't drunk water in like six hours, and you take a drink, and you just feel so much better. Water's critical. And in California, when we have good rains, you should see Palm Springs in the spring. Oh my goodness, the wildflowers are the most incredible colors and through the mountains in that area is all the orange poppies blossoming and purple colors and it's like the desert floor is a carpet from a floor shop. It's so incredible and you'd look at the desert most of the year and you think nothing lives in there, it's just a pile of sand and tumbleweeds. And yet when the water comes it changes everything. Most of the ancient cities in the world were built on waterways. Look at our country, too. You have to have water. When people moved, they had to park themselves to build their cities and their villages by water. Babylon had the Euphrates. Paris has the Seine. London has the Thames. Cairo in Egypt has the Nile. Rome didn't get one, so Rome built an aqueduct. They were so good with water, those Romans. They built all the fountains and the water systems. And I'm so glad because now we have faucets in our houses. And, and so California... And L.A. didn't have a good water system either, so they built an aqueduct from Northern California to Southern California so Southern California could survive. I think there's one going north from Colorado into New Mexico, too. Or I'm not sure about that, but I just know the water comes down there, and, and thus the populations can make it below. King Hezekiah in Jerusalem, if you've been to Israel, how many have been in Hezekiah's tunnel? Okay, that's a little scary if you have claustrophobia. <laughs> I, I hear they've updated it because I went once and that was enough for me. But he built this tunnel that was unbelievable that went from the outside spring under the wall into the city of Jerusalem. So when they were sieged by armies, they would have water in there. And he had to go through rock and how they met. It was just one of those engineering unbelievable things in those days. So they brought water into the city. Psalm 46 says that Jerusalem isn't situated beside a river, but it has a river. 
and it comes from the holy place is what that verse says it has a river that comes from the holy place from the throne of god in verse 5 psalm 46 and god is in the midst of her she shall not be moved you know that verse so well god is an anchor for our souls there's water mentioned all through the word of god water for washing the cleansing of the word of god Water for drinking, a pitcher of the Holy Spirit being poured out. John 7, 27, Jesus said, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink, and he'll never thirst again. The woman at the well, if you would have known who was talking to you to come to me and asked for a drink. The river brings refreshment to a dry soul. Peace and joy, solutions, solace and victory. When I was young, I was telling some of the Minnesota girls here that um, I was born in Rochester, Minnesota. My dad was going to school at the Mayo Clinic, and um, and so they came out west, and he set up practice in Pasadena. So that's where I grew up. And while he was there, I remember on TV he was watching westerns. And I loved animals and horses, so this was great fun for me. I'd sit with my dad and, and watch westerns. You know, you're too old to remember, I mean, too young, but, you know, it was like Wagon Train and Rawhide and all of those westerns. And amazing in those days, they didn't swear and they had morals, and it's kind of like the old, old ones that are just like, it's gone so bad since then. But my dad got real excited about this and thought he'd buy a ranch. He's a Minnesota boy, let's go west and buy a ranch. But of course he had to practice medicine to pay for this ranch, which is outrageous expensive. It's like a big hole, his friend said, in the ground, you just pour money in it. (laughs) So that's exactly what happened. But I had great fun on that ranch as a kid, because I'd go out and go horseback riding and swim in the reservoir, and you know, I just, it was just, it was just great fun for a kid. I remember I couldn't wait till Fridays and get out of school and put on my jeans and cowboy boots and flannel shirts and Cowboy hat and go to the ranch. I know, that's a funny picture, isn't it, of me? And, um, and so this ranch that he bought, smack dab out by Barstow, if you ever know where that is, I say that is where the black widows and the sidewinders and the coyotes live. Am I right, girls? You California, ex-California girls. And I go, uh, it's just out in the middle of nowhere. And there were three ranches that grew alfalfa and my dad grew cattle too along a railroad track coming out of Barstow and all this green alfalfa and all these fields out in the middle of the desert. What it was is a river ran under that area. And so the people at the ranch before us did a well and went down and pulled up that river and irrigated all the fields and watered the cattle and, and it was called the Hidden River Ranch. And I think that's a great application to our lives. There is a river that runs in all of us straight from the streams of God. And he has, he has asked you to come there and draw up from the well that water. Spurgeon said, not by hasty reading either, but by deep meditation will we profit from the word of God. If you're just, I gotta read it to get to work kind of person, and you're half exhausted and sleeping, Maybe you should just read a little bit and read more at night when you're awake. But you've got to find that time. I've known girls who work, and they're so tired and they have to work so early that they have lunch breaks and they'll go sit in an office or their car, and they'll have their quiet time with the Lord and have you know, their sack lunch or whatever it is they do. So if you want to do it, the Lord, the Lord helps them do it. I remember one lady, she said, Jesus, if you give me carpeting on my bedroom floor, I'll get up for my devotions, and she did. So she, she had to get up and do it. When you have a a plant, you know the plants in your house, a potted plant? If you don't water it for a long time, you put water on it, it runs right through because the dirt's so hard, it just goes. But if you water it regularly, it soaks in because it's already damp and it's pulling in all the rest of the water. So with us, regular watering at the river causes the word to stick to our souls. And there are, you know, there's difficulties with it. Just you girls know this, I don't really need to tell you this, but to have a place and if you need a cup of coffee and have your Bible, have a good devotional books there. Sometimes I have a few because some days I like ones better than other or I just need more help afterwards. And so ask the Holy Spirit 
when you're reading it. Sometimes, you know, I'm so tired and I'm going, what did I just read? And did you ever do that? And I go back and read it. And then I just have to stop and say to the Holy Spirit, you're just going to wake me up and let me see what you're saying here. And he does. He loves to do that. I want to talk to you a little bit about the children. Because this, I watch the news and I have to tell you girls, sometimes I can hardly watch it. It's just so stressful. It makes me so crazy. And I see this country that is such a unbelievable, I guess I've just lived long enough that I've seen a fabulous country. A country that grew up where most people went to church. And I've seen it almost going socialistic and it's absolutely frightening to me. And I think we're going to be persecuted as Christians. We just are. And it's going to get probably worse and uglier just because we know prophecy. And you know we're not falling apart, we're falling into place. But we're living in this. And I could understand Jeremiah. And I could understand the prophets as they wept over Jerusalem and Israel and going, what is happening here? And so I think if we don't tell our children the greatness of God, who's going to tell them? And we've lost another generation. And it's so sad. I think the great part of my generation is the awful part were the hippies, which aren't much different than what's going on in universities today. I look at that and I go, they were berserk. They were burning things and they were killing each other and there was all this unrest in the country. But it drove the hippies to Jesus because they had tried free love and you know all, all, all the drugs. And, and it wasn't working for them. And when the Jesus movement hit, that's why so many of them got saved that lived through the drugs. And I don't know if that's coming again or not. But I do know that we have to tell our children. You can only do what God puts in your hands to do. And you have, how many of you have children? How many of you have grandchildren? Okay, there's a lot of kids represented in this room. So I'm gonna tell you about my grand, my daughter-in-law who has seven children with her husband, our son. She's actually writing a book about it. She's a school teacher, so Anyway, she says, you know, that there are, they are so involved with the mechanisms like the cell phone and the games that she actually has the kids check their cell phone at the door when they come to her house to play with her kids. And, you know, they get upset. She says, no, 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 here's a basket. Put your phone in it. You came here to play. Let's have fun. We're not sitting on our phone. We're going to talk to each other. We're going to play games. We're going to have fun. And she says it's destroying our young people. And, it, and something just came out. It was in the news or a documentary from, I can't remember, it, you, one of the famous um, commentators on how disturbing this is for our children today. That, you know, it's not making them creative. It's not making them be able to communicate with each other. It's totally, they're finding out hurting the toddlers that are on iPads hours a day instead of, playing and learning and you know it's just and, and I can I, I remember thinking what a great way it would be for the enemies to totally steal the children like the Pied Piper like things getting out there I my, my daughter-in-law was looking the other day and um, she said that they had just come out on the news where some whoever the enemy had figured out how to put in absolutely terrorizing things into the little toddler's programs on the iPad. Did you hear that, see this? And they accidentally can, can just click on it. And one child was so stressed out, the mother finally took him to a psychiatrist and found out that these things were popping up in the iPad. They were absolutely horror movies type stuff. And the kids were freaking out. Who does that? They go, we live in a wicked world, so we need to be wise. So, we need to have alternatives, and the alternative is God's word. So my daughter-in-law thought, you know what? She was reading her devotions. She saw her kids, you know, kind of doing something with their Bibles and like Daniel, you know. And in the morning, she would put them on when she woke up the TV because they don't, they just have video stuff. So she put in like Veggie Tales or something that was going to be a devotional for her children, and she had them do that as kind of a devotional for them. And then one day, she looked at her children and she said, you know what, you guys, tell you what I'm going to do. I think it's really important that you read the Bible. And so I will pay you $100 to read the Old Testament if you read it in a year. 
and I will pay you $50 if you read the New Testament. So that's $150 in a year if you read through the whole thing. Well, that was pretty exciting. That's a lot of money for a kid. And I said, Brenda, that's a lot of money. She said, I don't care. It was worth it to me. It was absolutely worth it to me. So one day, Joshua, he's number three. He, I number them. And he says, Mom, I'm ready for my hundred and fifty my check. She said, What are you talking about? She said, You know, you told me if I read it, I get hundred and fifty dollars. She said, Yeah. He said, Well, I'm finished. It's December and I'm finishing up. She said, Really? So she said, You know what? She taught his class at school in junior high. And so she said, um, I'm gonna give it to you in class. So they went to class that day and she said, Okay. She said, This is what I did at my house, and she told all the kids what she did. And she handed her son the money in front of all the students. I imagine their eyes were like, wow. And then she turned to the class. Now, it was a smaller class, junior high. And I think it had a dozen students in it. And she said, I'm going to do the same for every one of you in this class. I will give you $150 to read through the Bible in a year. And I went, oh, oh, Mrs. McClure, you can't do that for us. That's too much money for you and Pastor Mike. That's just way too much. And she said, no, no, no. She said, if I wanted money, I would have gotten a job in the Silicon Valley, and I'd have made a lot of money. She's real smart. She was honors and graduating from college. And she said, but I didn't, I didn't live this life to do that. I'm all about you, and I care about you and your souls much more than I do money. So I'm, I'm making this offer to you. And I think everyone in the class but one or two decided, I think two, and maybe they're doing it now, I don't know. Well, anyway, this was the worst class in the school. You know how you always have one that's the naughty class? Well, that was it. And she really had to take it because her husband was the pastor because she was terrified to give it to any other teacher. They might quit. <laughs> so she took this really difficult, I think it was a seventh grade class. And, you know, a, a couple months later, she was talking to a couple teachers and they said to her, Brenda, we've noticed that your class has really changed. You're a lot nicer. What, what did you do to them? She said, I have no idea. But they really have changed, haven't they? They said, yeah, your whole class is totally changing. And she said, I don't, I don't know. And one of the girls in the class was standing there, and she said, Mrs. McCoy, don't you know why our class changed? She says, no, I have no idea. She said, you told us to read through the Bible. So over Christmas vacation, we were cramming to get a bunch ahead and get it done. And she said it changed all of us. You see, you never know. What an investment. I go, wow, Brenda, that was a lot of money. And the neat part, too, is some of the parents would come to Brenda on the side and go, here's $500 for my kid and someone else. And here's, you know, I want to pay for my child, or here's a little contribution to all of that. And so the Lord made up the difference for them. I don't know if it all got paid or not. She did not care. But I thought, it is the word of God that changes our lives. So what is the most important thing you can give your children? You can give them the word of God. Let them see it and tell them about it. It is so awesome. And, of course, get them Bibles for their age. Don't make it so far above them. I said, what do you do for the younger ones that you know couldn't read the New King James or whatever? She said, they have Bible storybooks that you know go through, but it's all age appropriate for each one to read through. And um, the scripture tells us you're to do that with the children. You walk, sit down, lie down, talk with them. I remember my number three, he was going, he was the last one at home, and he was going off to high school, and he'd sit down and have breakfast in the morning and feed him at the kitchen counter, and, um, and I'd read him daily bread. And today he has his devotions. And he's the one who's helping his wife, you know, get up early, Aaron, you got to plan this, and he's the whole thing. And, and um, he liked my utmost, and I thought, wow. But he watched us, and it made all the difference, because he would have been probably my worldly one. And he, he really made a lot of money really young, and then the Lord changed him upside down, and he said, I don't, I don't care. I realized that that did not fix anybody's problems. The Bible's a map for your life. I call it mapquest.com. It's their strength, their peace, their answers, their very life source. And when they are old, they won't depart from it.
Don't depend on Sunday school Christian schools, tell your women. Don't depend on us to give them all. We only have them a couple hours a week. You have them all week. Share with them what you have received. We're going to talk about that in the next section. Make it real and practical. And I love how practical God's word is. I remember one time my oldest son Marcus and his family was living in the a, a, a ravine that went from one city to the other in California. And in that whole area on that highway were all kinds of wild animals and a mountain lion lived in their vicinity. And he was huge, like eight feet long with a tail. And I had little tiny grandchildren then. And I am terrified that he's going to eat one of my grandchildren. This was my devotions in the morning when I was stressing about this. I said, Jesus, please do not let them eat any of my children. Psalm 104, 21 was in my reading. The lions roar for their prey, and they seek their food from God. I said, all right, Lord, if they seek it from you, don't give them people. <laughs> I thought, and the Lord just gave me a piece about it. And they moved after that because my son, you know what sumac is? It's a plant like poison oak. My son broke off with it so bad they had to move to town. I go, yes, whatever that is. <laughs> I love the scripture. I sent this to one of my kids who's working with one of their kids lately. Isaiah 49, 25, a verse he gave me when my kids were young. I will contend with him who contends with you, and I will save your children. Isaiah 49, 25. Our roots are to go down deep into him, that river. You may say you have other roots causing problems, roots of bitterness and roots of rebellion. And you can't get rid of them. But you know what? Jesus can. You have to go there with that too. And you give it to him. He'll pull those things out by the root. If you hula ho, you know what that is. You cut down the weeds. It's just chopping them off there at the top. The weeds can come up bigger and thicker than ever because you haven't gone down and pulled out by the roots. That's why, what is that thing, Roundup works? Because it goes down and kills the roots. And you have to let Jesus pull out the bad roots in your life. And then he'll take over and he'll become the good root in your life. Jesus says in Revelation twenty two sixteen, I am the root, the spring of David, the bright and morning star. And that is a root you want, and it comes from your devotional life. Revelation twenty two. One, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great streets of the city. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city. His servants will serve him. I wonder what kind of jobs we'll have in heaven. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need a light or a lamp or the light of the sun. Isn't that? We stop and think about those things. For the Lord God will, be, will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Behold, I'm coming soon. And blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. So we better know the book from cover to cover. It's so important. Christians don't grow because they don't dig in it and they don't meditate on it. Teach that to your women and to your children so they can tell their children and their children's children. It is our only saving grace. It is truth. It is not a lie and a day, age that is absolutely filled with lies. All the fake news <laughs> from the devil about everything. And you know what? You have the truth. Because you have the river of life flowing through you. He is going to strengthen you. He's going to encourage you. And when you wake up in the morning, he's going to tell you what you need to know. He's going to give you promises and answers. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you saw we needed it. And Lord, we love you for that. For those that are struggling with it, because maybe they have early morning jobs, whatever, just, just Lord, help them find time where, Lord, you can really meet with them and they can be alert. Or 
things are pressing in or everything comes to try and stop that, Lord, I pray that you'd open up those doors that their devotional lives will all become very, very rich and that their children will catch on to this and their grandchildren. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I think, and I'm closing, but I, I sometimes say that I think that Jesus went back to the Father and he said, they need a lot of help down there, Father. I, I, you know, it, it's, it's, not, it's not good. So I think we need to send him a book and the Holy Spirit who's going to teach him this book. And I thought he thought of everything we needed. Amen.